Well, good morning. That's a tough act to follow. Uh, <laughs> My uh, husband is a Dane, and um, I have the joy of um, having him grown up with uh, strong women around him like Hella. Um, but I, I wanted to share with you a little bit of, of our story, our thinking about the company of the future. Um, and I started my career in technology um, kind of by accident. I had a passion for uh, changing healthcare, and it was at the time that technology was really starting uh, to change businesses and the way of working. So I thought, what better place to be was um, in healthcare, changing lives and improving uh, science and the delivery of patient care. And actually, you know, 25 years later, I find myself with a nice career in management consulting, still trying to change healthcare and trying to change the world. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I call, uh, we, what we are calling the bionic company, but hold the thought about why I'm talking about bionic for a minute. I want to start with, well, technology, you. And I took a picture of this room earlier um, just to show to our executive committee that there are way more women than, uh, than we think in technology. But technology started with women, <laughs> right? Some of the best in innovations in computer science, in computational technology, in the application of machine learning, of AI, of whatever you think about it, um, has been women with women. Why? Because women think across organizational boundaries. Women are innovative. You are innovative. I am innovative. And, and somehow, despite that, all the dudes out there keep saying more stuff about technology. So I want to encourage you to continue to innovate and continue to lead in the field of technology, just like these ladies uh, ahead of us. And by the way, lest we think any of this technology is new, yes, AI has a, um, a, a museum in, MI, in MIT. There's a museum of robotics and AI. So some of these things have existed for a long time. It's a question of how we use them and how we bring them to the enterprise, which is a little bit about my talk. So I'm going to start with a bit of the fundamentals of advantage. So this is going from the, the, the macros of leadership to uh, corporate strategy. Most organizations actually started with the Industrial Revolution. The harnessing of technology to improve productivity um, pioneered with the automotive plants and a lot of factories. And I would argue that a lot of our organizational models are still living in that factory model, apart from the more disruptive startups. So um, from BCG, of course, we always think about competitive advantage. So competitive advantage at that time was about economies of scale. So the more you produce, the more you could specialize, the more experience you got, the cheaper it was to produce things. So incremental improvements mattered. So that was fine for a while. And the new thing wasn't technology. It was the organizational model that harnessed the technology to advantage. Enter the digital economy, harnessing technology in a different way. But that organizational model actually doesn't work in this world. The digital economy is really about speed. Um, and it basically shifts uh, the uh, learning curve that used to exist in corporate environments uh, to a different learning curve much more quickly than others. So organizations need to learn and adapt much more quickly. Technology becomes you know, a fundamental part of the product and service and not something that's delivered out of a shared service um, organization or an IT function that's separate. Technology and data is the business model. And those uh, startups that actually have done very well in the digital economy have harnessed the power of moving very quickly um, and disrupting in competitive spaces. And I believe that the future is going to be no, more about um, something else. It's going to be more about the learning economy. So in the future, as we get more and more technology, more data, more algorithms that can help to organize um, and help us to create new things, uh, the 20s, 2020 and beyond, uh, we believe will be about learning. So how quickly can a company compete? How quickly can a company adapt to changes in uh, the disruptors that are coming from the digital economy, so startups um, and tech companies effectively? but also to the changes in the political and social and economic uh, circumstances that actually no one can predict. Um, so we at BCG worked with uh, CEOs and C-suite executives quite often on, OK, how do we actually think about the future? How do we harness technology? How do we manage um, amongst these disruptive forces? And actually, most of the people that we work with are the large corporates that actually, frankly, stand only to be threatened 
uh, by this learning economy. Why? Because they look like the Model T Ford's uh, production lines. The organizational model hasn't taken um, the next step forward um, in terms of adapting and changing. So most executives are actually frustrated with what they have. They, they, they see the technology out there, they see the threats from the startups, some of the companies that you guys work with, um, and they have a lot of experiments. Maybe they've hired a new chief digital officer, maybe they've fired and hired a new chief information officer, maybe they have a new head of product, they have a new uh, uh, um, startup that they've acquired, they've got a new innovation center. And so I see some heads nodding. Yes, of course, we try all those things. They invest in technology and maybe this big technology project's gonna solve the world's problems. But the returns just don't come. And why is that? We have all the technology in the world to solve you know, issues of climate, issues of poverty, issues of sustainability. We have those things, why can't we get them to work? So we believe the future uh, company, when you look into the future, it's gonna have to be bionic. And by that, when we started to talk about the naming of this, all the guys that I work with said, oh yeah, the bionic man, I like that. No, 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 there is the bionic woman. <laughs> Uh, and the bionic woman um, was basically augmented with technology, so is the $6 million man. If, for those of you who will remember the TV show in the 70s, now I'm showing my, um, my age and also that I grew up in North America. <laughs> um, but the company of the future, we believe, is pick the word that you want. It's technology augmenting humans. It's where the organization will become more human, not less. And there's a lot of narrative right now about, oh, well, technology is going to just replace all the jobs that we have, and, and it's going to be a more autonomous enterprise and all that kind of stuff. I don't believe that. I believe that our, our organizations of the future, yes, there will be automation. There'll be automation of the routine stuff that doesn't require thinking. It'll be automation of the things that actually people work around today. The future company has to be more about harnessing the power of technology and humanity together in order to create advantage. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we mean by that. So the first is thinking about at the center, strategy and purpose. So the company of the future will be oriented around that learning economy. So how quickly do I need to adapt? What are my real sources of advantage? How do I harness those in the markets that I serve? Importantly, the company of the future will also be about purpose. And by that I mean the why. Why do people come to work? What matters to them most? I don't come to work because I actually like writing PowerPoint slides, contrary to what people think about consultants. Uh, I come to work because I feel like I'm making a difference in the world. I feel like I'm leading an organization that is making a difference in the world. And I feel like my individual contributions matter. And that's in healthcare, that's in our technology practice, whatever. You need to think about what your company's purpose is, what your own individual purpose is, and how that plays out. And I think we have um, empirical evidence that companies that actually articulate the, for, uh, their purpose and focus on that um, actually have above average shareholder returns. So purpose matters. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the other, the other pieces, but you know, the fundamentals starting with strategy and purpose. Let's talk about the outcomes. So a lot of people talk about new technology. Here's a new piece of software. Here's a new Google Glass that, that people can do stuff, right? But actually, they don't really think, think holistically about the outcomes that matter. Now, it's an exciting time to be in technology. I've said that for 25 years. I still believe it's a really exciting time to be in technology, probably now more than ever. The outcomes that matter, though, are what we should focus on, not the technology itself. So how are we changing the way drugs are discovered and uh, delivered into populations? How are we changing the way people move around cities um, and the environment and uh, sustainability elements that, that, that go with that? How are we personalizing the, the customer experience and shifting the way people purchase goods and services? How are we fundamentally shifting the safety profile of some of the most dangerous jobs in the world uh, through the use of AI and machine learning and technology? It's those outcomes that matter most um, that, that people should focus on. So the company of the future will focus on the really audacious outcomes that matter that are linked to their purpose. They will also have a different approach to technology. And this is the bit that um, I like to talk about, of course, and I hope you all um, like to hear about it. Um, but I'm gonna get on to the organization stuff because I think that's as important as the technology. So 
um, as we looked at the company of the future, we started to look at the sort of industry pioneers that are really changing the game. So still large companies that are changing the game. If you look at Tesla, for instance, their approach to technology is fundamental to their strategy. They can implement a new business model, a, a fundamental change in their commercial policy, design and test it and roll it out globally in a matter of days. Think about your IT function, if you're running one or if you're using one or whatever. How long does it take you to get anything done? <laughs> it takes six days is even talking about how to get the right person to start defining the requirements. Like, that doesn't work. That's not bionic, right? Well, why? This is a typical um, uh, IT architecture chart at the very simplest level for a, a retail bank, p one part of the retail bank. It lives because you know, it's grown up on these like, individual package so solutions that are sort of hardwired together and sort of interfaced in a spaghetti uh, mess of stuff. And that makes it long and hard to get stuff done. It also makes it actually less um, likely that people are working cross-functionally because they're sort of trapped in their little silos organizationally and also because of the systems that we all implement, right? So I think the bionic company, and you'll, you'll forgive me with a bit of a cooking analogy, but I can do that with this group, I think. Um, you need to move from the spaghetti that exists today um, of the underlying technology into something that looks more like ravioli. And I use this with CEOs that are uh, um, uncomfortable with technology, right? So this is the spaghetti to ravioli is basically from that messy sticky tape and wires situation that I have to something that's more modular, um, where you move one piece and the other pieces uh, don't necessarily have to be affected. So um, APIs and microservices and modular architecture, you're all smiling, um, but most CEOs actually can't get their head around some of that stuff unless they're the CEOs of a tech company. The interesting thing, though, is not how do you do it, because we've been talking about that for a while. It's sort of like, it's sort of not what you do, it's more how do you do it, sorry. Um, so how do you do it? So it's basically going from the spaghetti to the ravioli in pieces that deliver business value as you go. So rather than saying, oh, eventually all of my systems landscapes will, will be better, the bionic company starts to use data and move uh, that data through the organization um, one business case at a time. And most um, IT organizations actually have to work much closer to the business in the company of the future. So there is not um, a big wall between business and IT, especially when you think about agile delivery. So the impact of this in the company of the future will be double uh, the value that gets created, faster time to market, and lower cost. It's quite obvious uh, when you look at it, but it's not what happens today in today's sort of very siloed large organizations. So from a technology perspective, the company of the future will need to think about three things. Technology is not a separate function. It's integrated in the business model. Data and the assets that go with data um, and AI and learning are a fundamentally new capability that need to be established in any organization. Even if you do have an AI function or AI capability, those things will need to be growing. There will be more modern architecture, so think ravioli. Um, and there'll be a next generation technology delivery model. So the walls between technology and business going away. So that's the um, technology side. That should all be you know, relatively straightforward. And actually, the, the devil's in how to get it done. The human side is the interesting thing. My experience is there's a big wall between the HR function and the technology function. In fact, each one doesn't understand the other. Um, and so my big move at BCG, I've only been the global practice leader for a year, was to bring my technology practice together with the people in org practice. And so we can talk about technology and humanity. We can talk about introducing technology change and the people change that goes with it in order to make things work. So on the human side, well, technology is changing, but so are the people. You guys all know this, but like what the millennials want in the future um, and what the next generations of jobs are massively changing. How people work is massively changing, and we need to help people do that. And the skills that people need in the future will be massively different. The skills actually that my children, so I have a 13-year-old and an 11-year-old, much bigger than that little guy, um, but the skills of the future will much more be about our things that are in innately human. The things that kind of the modern or today's organization actually steal away from us day to day. 
They take away our energy, they take away our critical thinking, they take away our creativity through spreadsheets and annual reports and uh, quarterly business reviews and all that kind of stuff. The company of the future, the bionic company, needs to harness emotional intelligence and creativity. That man-machine interaction only works if you have the man and the woman uh, to think about how, how, how to use technology, what technology can be applied towards. And most organizations have massive gaps in the structures that they establish and the people that they encourage to work within. And the organization of the future is going to need to learn. Um, so we, we helped uh, Microsoft with their transformation, and, and Satya uh, came and spoke um, at one of our meetings. And he said the biggest transformation in their culture was to go from a know-it-all organization to a learn-it-all organization. And the company of the future is need, going to need to be full of people like yourselves who are continuously learning. You go to school, great. But you, that's not like you have one job and you're going to stay at a company and, and that's going to, you know, it's not the reality. The reality is you're going to have a ton of different jobs and every day is a new day. Every day you're learning new stuff. That's one of the things why I like my job in consulting, because I never actually have to stay anywhere for so long that I, I am not learning. And so think about for yourself and your own leadership, you know, how are you encouraging your organization to learn? How are you learning yourself? Obviously, you are learning people because you're here. But being able to sort of more adaptively think about the skills that you need and encourage people to actually get those. And the organization of the future in this bionic company is going to be much more agile and platform-based. And by that, I mean, we talked about the modular technology architecture. There's going to be much more process-based um, and agile architecture for organizations. So what, what does that mean? I mean? People are going to work in iterative cycles. I'm trying to not use the word agile too much. <laughs> uh, they're working in iter iterative cycles. They'll be more data-driven. They'll be more cross-functional in the way that they work. Um, so not sales, marketing, operations, um, and the like, but having cross-functional teams working on things. And they'll be more decentralized and more open. Um, and we will be thinking more about talent across ecosystems and not just within one organization. This kind of thing just blows the CEO's head off, right? So, and the CHRO, they're often quite far behind on, on it. So basically, it's sort of saying you need to kind of throw up your organizational model because we aren't making those Ford Model T cars anymore. We're doing something very, very different, and we need to compete differently with our technology and our talent. So on the human side, this is normally a quite a longer talk, but I want to make sure we get to questions. But the human side is more about leadership. Um, and Hella spoke about uh, some of the characteristics of leadership that are fantastically relevant in, in the modern economy or in the, in the bionic company. But the leadership and the management of talent won't be about telling people what to do and how to do it and where to do it. Uh, thank goodness. <laughs> It'll be about getting alignment and letting pe autonomous teams deliver against those aligned objectives. Again, middle management, senior management in most organizations look at me like, what? <laughs> because they think boxes and wires and command and control and that kind of thing. The next generations of leaders, you people, will be about um, ensuring that you have a shared purpose, cl clarity of objectives, clarity of the way you want stuff to, to happen, and then you need to let your teams uh, actually do that. There'll be new ways of working, so I talked about that, multidisciplinary teams, agile methods, and that kind of thing, but those new ways of working will be heavily enabled by technology. Most organizations will have to have a technology fluency that they don't have today. They'll need you um, in the room, and then they'll need you know, the next uh, f few rooms also uh, full. Um, they'll need a new approach to talent, as I talked about, so mobile working, uh, different incentives, different locations. And then they'll need a much different organizational structure and operating model. And by that, I, I mean uh, performance, incentives, reward, and that kind of thing. And finally, they'll be thinking about ecosystems. So how do I t tap into the pool, uh, the broader network that I have, and not just think about the things within the walls of my own organization? So that's all a lot to manage, right? Um, and so at this point, most CEOs say, OK, well, that's great. But you know, where do I even start? Because my organization is thousands of people in multiple geographies, multiple products, and that kind of thing. So I'll give you a couple of simple ways to think about it. The first is, actually, a lot of people focus on the technology, or in the AI world, they focus on the algorithm. It's really not about that. It's the combination of it. And actually, it's mostly about changing people, processes, and ways of working. 
we have all the technology in the world, um, not all that we need, because there's still more to do in, in, in science and discovery, but we have a ton of technology. What we don't have is the operating models to harness that technology for advantage. So it's 10% the algorithm, so think 10% data science, AI, and that kind of thing, 20% technology, and 70% change, changing people, behavior, and way of working. And un unfortunately, that's harder than the technology. The technology is the easy part, I think, in this. So think about the strategy and purpose. And so you, you might think about this for your own organization or your department or the function that you're running or your, how you're thinking about your own leadership model. But think about the strategy and purpose. Then pick an area that you want to make a difference. So think about the outcome that you're trying to drive. It's part of your business performance. It's part of an innovation. It's part of a, an outcome or a KPI that you're trying to deal with. Then think about the human and the technology side together, not one or the other. So not the people in the boxes and then an IT project on the side, but how are you going to get those two things together? And do that as a full circle in one area. And I see a lot of organizations with thousands of proofs of concepts and little ideas that have not scaled. Why? Because they haven't thought about a thing that matters, the people and the technology together. So when you do that and then you extend that ap approach over and over again, then you start to get into a broader set of things around well, really flipping your organizational model around outcomes, people, and technology. And so our view is the, the Bionic company, so the company of the future, mostly is about a large organizations, but it'll also be about the disruptive organizations that grow into large organizations. They're going to need to think about bringing this holistic per perspective together, technology and humanity. So in conclusion, I would just say um, this is a purpose statement that I came up with for our technology function, and it's about pushing the edge of po possibility. Um, and I would encourage you in this room uh, to think about how you push the edge of possibility with technology and also your human side together, um, because actually we women are fundamentally good at those things together, um, and that's an advantage for us in the market. So think about how you're going to push the edge of possibility and how you're the bionic woman augmented with technology in the back of your heart, but also having the heart and the purpose that it takes to drive change in the organization. Thank you.